Hi, I'm Joseph R. Wheeler III, welcoming you to a very special episode of Onyx Khan Outdoors Worldwide. Most people who enjoy the art of fishing, the art of angling, may be aware that fishing is nothing new and that the practice of fishing has been around for centuries. But did you know that the true origin of most methods of modern day fishing all started in Africa, particularly in ancient Kemet, which is Egypt. Egypt is the root of most modern day angling practices. And an article that I found online here will describe everything with facts, with references to prove that point. Please share this with anyone that you know who is interested in knowing more about the truth about the history of fishing and the amazing legacy that Africa, like so many other things Africa gave the world, continue to be less recognized and need to be championed and celebrated because that is the beauty of Black history. Sankofa, y'all. Sankofa is an ancient Ashante symbol and proverb that means to go back and fetch it. You got to know your past to move forward into your glorious future. Enjoy. Fishing in Ancient Egypt. Published by Rocky River. Written by Kenneth J. Stein, PhD, contributing author, The Rocky River, com. Let's start our journey with a trip inside some of the complex of tombs near the Steppe Pyramid at Saqqara. This was the necropolis, or burial ground, for the ancient Egyptian capital, Memphis. Scorpion fish from within the mortuary complex of Hatshepsut, the first female pharaoh, 1500 BC. Note that depictions from the newer kingdoms are not as rich in detail as those from the older kingdoms that you saw in the previous photos. Mararika was a vizier to the pharaoh Teddy, 2323 BC. Fish species include tilapia, eels, pufferfish, catfish, elephant fish, mullet, carp, Nile perch, upside down catfish, and moonfish. T was a supervisor of the pyramids, 2474 BC. In this scene, he is out with his men on a hippopotamus hunt. Note the many fish species below the papyrus boat that include upside down catfish, elephant fishes, tilapia, puffer fish, Egyptian eel, moonfish, catfish, and electric catfish. Tis stature in society is shown by how he dwarfs his men. Hippos and crocodiles are apparent on the right side of the panel and depicted the same size as the fish. Kagemni was a vizier during the time of King Djoser, 2649 BC. Men fish from a papyrus boat. One man fishes with a multi-hooked line. Another holds a landing net. Fish species in this scene include carp, mullet, catfish, upside-down catfish, elephant fish, tilapia, Nile perch, and eel. On the left side of the panel, note the frog and grasshopper resting on shining pondweed, potamogeton lucens, that is still found throughout the Nile today. Kagemni was a vizier during the time of King Djoser, 2649 BC. The two men fish from a papyrus raft. Note the men's outstretched index fingers that indicate they are fishing. On the right side of the panel is shining pondweed, potamogeton lucens, which is still found throughout the Nile today. Idit was a queen and the daughter of King Djoser, 2323 BC. The man fishes from a papyrus boat with a fishing line in one hand and a club in the other. Note the basket of fish. Idit was a queen and the daughter of King Djoser, 2323 BC. This photo shows a crocodile and elephant nose fish. Both are found in Egypt today, although the crocodile is presently found south of the Aswan Dam. The Steppe Pyramid of King Djoser that was built during the Third Dynasty, 2630-2611 BC. A good part of Egypt was also covered by sea up to the 23rd parallel near the city of Luxor. The evidence for this is the variety of fossils such as coral, shark's teeth, and sea urchins that are scattered throughout the Sahara. Ancient Egypt wasn't always a desert environment. Many years ago, some of it was forest or forested wetland and its petrified forests are proof of this. One of these ancient forests is located outside of Cairo in the eastern Sahara Desert. 
The ancient Egyptians left a rich legacy about their sciences in the tombs of the pharaohs, beginning about 2400 BC. This information was prescribed by their religion and consisted of carvings, paintings, and papyrus texts. Within their tombs, you can find scenes of agriculture, animal husbandry, beekeeping, winemaking, basket weaving, woodworking, etc. You can also view scenes of fishing and hunting, the most commonly depicted nature themes. The carvings and paintings within the tombs are exceptionally detailed. Archaeologists and biologists use these to study the natural history and ecology of plants, birds, fish, and animals. When they combine this information with historic timelines, they are able to reconstruct the past. They can tell us how climate change and local catastrophes caused changes in the distribution of species and how certain species were extirpated, or became extinct. Ancient Egypt wasn't always a desert environment. Many years ago, some of it was forest or forested wetland. Its petrified forests are proof of this, and these can be found throughout a few areas in Egypt, including one outside of Cairo in the eastern Sahara Desert. A good part of Egypt was also covered by sea up to the 23 parallel near the city of Luxor. The evidence for this is the variety of fossils such as coral, shark's teeth, and sea urchins that are scattered throughout the Sahara. Text from the 18 Dynasty, 1550 to 1292 BC. We can only imagine that the fishermen of ancient Egypt were a lot like us. Fishing was a popular pastime. It provided an opportunity for either solitude or camaraderie. Like today, some fished by themselves and others, in groups. Many did it for sport and or food. Others made their living from it. They fished from banks and in boats or rafts that were made from papyrus and other reeds. The ancient Egyptian anglers also used a variety of techniques, including baited hooks, hand nets, drag nets, fish baskets or weir traps, and harpoons. Hooks were carved from pieces of bone, wood, shell or ivory. Based on the results from archaeological finds, fish hooks averaged one-third, seven inches in length. Eventually, the Egyptians evolved and began crafting their hooks from copper and bronze. When this happened as a source of conflict, most sources place metal fish hooks in later dynasties, Dynasty the 12th, 1991 to 1778 BC. However, a famous Egyptologist by the name of Sir William Flinders Petrie dated one specimen of a barbed copper fish hook at 2500 BC. This latter scenario seems probable as the period was well into the Bronze Age, which began in 3300 BC. In any case, the Egyptians gave barbed metal fish hooks to the world. Fishing line was made from the fibers of flax or linen. The Egyptians did not use a loose mass of fibers but a group of individually twisted threads. Certainly, the diameter and LB test of the line would be related to the number of linen threads. Sportsmen and recreational fishermen would use one or more hooks on a single line, and those who depended on fishing as a livelihood used multiple lines to improve their catches. Evidently, the ancient Egyptians didn't have to worry about legal restrictions with multi-hooked and multiple lines. The fishing lines were initially weighted with clay, but the Egyptians eventually upgraded to lead sinkers by 1200 BC. The British Museum of Natural History has one of these sinkers in its collection. The fishermen baited their hooks with various items such as stale bread, dates, meat, small fish, and undoubtedly, insects. In addition, they used ground bait, something that was sprinkled on top of the water to attract fish. It is interesting that they never used a small fish to target a larger fish of the same species. They may have considered it sacrilegious. Fishing in ancient Egypt was quite simple. The fisherman threw out his baited hook and rested the line on his index finger. He waited for some nibbles and tugs, and then set the hook. So, there you have it. The ancient Egyptians were bottom bouncers. You have to wonder how upset they became when they snagged the bottom. Was it a big deal to lose hooks and weights? or did they have an ample supply in their tackle boxes? And yes, they had tackle boxes that were made from wood or woven reeds. The tombs do not reveal the use of fishing rods or floats in the Old Kingdoms. Both of these came into existence sometime in later dynasties. Given that they knew how to fish the bottom then, it isn't much of a stretch to consider that they could also devise floats to carry the bait closer to the surface, and alert the angler to a strike. Accordingly, there exist reports of cork floats used by Egyptians but it remains unclear when this practice came about. Perhaps, one day, archaeologists will uncover evidence of this.
Fishing with nets was common in ancient Egypt for those fishing for need or livelihood. These were made from linen and constructed with knots that have been passed down from generation to generation. In fact, these knots, reef, mesh, and half, are universal among net fishermen today. However, fishnets were a costly item that many fishermen could not afford, and it was for this reason that the less affluent fishermen were restricted to fishing on the bank with lines. Drag net fishing involved more than a couple of fishermen. These nets were weighted with lumps of clay at the bottom and buoyed at the top with wooden floats. Fishermen would wade through the water and encircle a group of fish with their drag net. Upon trapping the fish, they would strike them with clubs or kill them with harpoons. During later dynasties, drag nets made use of lead weights and cork floats. Fish traps, or weir baskets, were made from the branches of willow trees. These wickerwork basket traps were conical in shape and used in one of two ways. For the first way, the Egyptians strategically placed these in the paths of migrating fish. For example, fish swimming upstream. The trap had the effect of corralling fish as they swam with the current. The second way involved placing the traps in water that was adjacent to submerged vegetation. People would walk into the vegetation and scatter the fish away from the shoreline and into the trap. Once captured, the fish were either clubbed or harpooned. Even today, fishermen use weir traps in various places throughout the world. The River Nile held a variety of fish, including Nile perch, tilapia, mullet, pufferfish, moonfish, mullets, carp, eels, elephantfish, catfish, and others. One of these catfish actually swam upside down and was appropriately called, the upside down catfish. At present, it is only found in the Nile below the Aswan Dam. Another catfish that was well known to the ancient Egyptians was the electric catfish. When fishermen caught these in nets, the fish produced sufficient electricity that shocked the fishermen. The volleys of electricity were strong enough to cause the fishermen to release their grip on the nets, allowing the electric catfish and all the other fish to escape. This species is still found in the Nile today. Finally, during the Greco-Roman period in Egypt, some fish, such as the Nile perch and the elephant fish, were considered sacred. There were prohibitions against keeping and eating these fish. Fishermen took great care while removing these fish from their nets to ensure their survival, and to avoid severe punishments. Both of these are doing fine in Egypt today. Although we don't have any evidence for bait and tackle shops, I like to think that these existed in ancient Egypt. You can easily imagine that many anglers wouldn't take the time to weave their own fishing lines or carve their own hooks, let alone find the best baits. Maybe the fishermen simply stopped by the shops to find out where the hotspots were and boast about their recent catches, or, to complain about the big one that got away. Maybe they had a piece of jerky and a hard-boiled egg, along with a cold one, yes, they had those items too. It must have been a great period to fish, even though they faced constant threats from crocodiles, hippos, and other large animals such as lions and hyenas. Making your livelihood from fishing was considered a very dangerous occupation. It is easy to see that the ancient Egyptians were the early innovators of modern-day fishing and most likely, not any different from us. If you have the chance to read any of their translations, you will find that they valued being in the outdoors and away from everyday life. They seemed to have a good time, like all anglers. It's incredible that the records in their tombs have lasted almost 5,000 years. Even more amazing is the fact that many of the same species of fish thrive in the waters of the Nile, today.